Well, hello. Here we are at the fourth and final session of the 2021 Argyll Bible Convention, which we've held in the beautiful west of Scotland town of Oban since 2013. We give you a very warm welcome, whether you've been with us for one or all of the sessions, or if you're joining us for the first time. Our theme this year has been trusting God in turbulent times, which is particularly appropriate for a time of pandemic. The four sessions have been held from Monday 2nd till Thursday 5th of August each evening at 7.30 p.m. Each session will also be available on YouTube in future, and we invite you to like, share, and subscribe this post. It's a privilege to have as our speakers this year Jonathan Lamb and John Risbridger. We're very grateful to them for their ministry. Each evening, local friends are leading us in prayer and reading the scripture. We hope you will enjoy this time of virtual fellowship, which we're sure will not only be a very different experience, but one shared with a much wider group of people than would otherwise have been possible in Oban in more normal times. This evening's speaker is John Risbridger. Thank you for joining with us, and God bless you. John, welcome back. Thank you. Um, am I right in thinking you're something of a, a musician, um, a singer? I, I seem to remember years ago you were leading the praise at a Keswick convention. How yeah. do we learn to praise God intelligently? Oh, thank you. Well, y yes, you're right um, that I, I used to lead the, the music and the praise at Keswick really for quite a number of years. I think it was a little bit over a decade I was doing that. Whether I was a singer or a musician is probably for others to judge, but I, I did my best. Um, and music's always been an important part of my life. I, I play the, the piano, love doing that, and uh, our family home was full of music really when we were, were growing up. So uh, I, I, I love music and continue to do that, although I don't lead um, very much music in, in, in worship settings any longer. The question about how we learn to praise God um, is, is a wonderful question. And even just the fact that you're asking the question, I think, is so important because I think so often we think of, of worship or praise kind of as a feeling that comes over us rather than as something that we have a responsibility to, to nurture and to grow and to, to deepen. So I think it's a wonderful question. Um, I, if you'll forgive the slightly shameless uh, piece of publicity, um, a number of years ago, I, I had a sabbatical summer and decided to write uh, on that very theme. So uh, this book here, the, uh, the Message of Worship in the Bible Speaks Today series is my attempt to really survey the scriptures um, in, in order to answer answer that question. So um, I'll have to be careful that I don't go on for too long in responding now. Um, let me just say three very quick things. Um, the first is to say that, that praise in the Bible, worship in the Bible, it has many reasons and we need to draw on those reasons. So often in the Psalms, for example, you'll get a call to praise, Psalm 33 or Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 96, for example. And it'll be, you know, sing to the Lord, all the earth, sing to the Lord, praise his name. And then almost always you'll find somewhere around verse two or three, there's a great big because, usually translated as four in, in our translations. So, so praise isn't just a feeling to drum up. It's a response to what God has shown uh, in his word and supremely in Christ. And, and I think the more we understand praise to be responsive to God's prior revelation, the more that can help us learn to praise. Uh, and that has implications, I think, for how we lead worship in congregational settings that we we want the scripture God's revelation of himself and, and the gospel God showing himself in Christ to to, to be the, the fuel of our worship and praise. So praise has many reasons. And um, the second thing I'd say is that praise has many voices 
as well. Uh, so again, if you if you read the Psalms, the, the scholars, when they, they talk about the Psalms, talk about the different genre of Psalms, the different kinds of Psalms. And there are praise Psalms and salvation history Psalms and lament Psalms and, and teaching Psalms and so on and so on. But we can almost reclaim that as not just a technical category for the scholars, but a sort of voice of worship with which we can learn to sing ourselves. And I think one of the challenges in the contemporary church is to learn to sing with that range of voices so that we can have, on the one hand, the enormous exuberance of Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, but we can also have the the, the, the solemn reverence of Psalm 97, uh, worship at his footstool for the Lord is, is holy. And then the heart-rending honesty of, of Psalm 88, which is, is, is angry and troubled, um, or even the doubt of Psalm 73. All these different voices uh, help us because they enable us to, to praise God in all the different seasons of life. So praise has its many voices, Praise has its many reasons. But then the final thing, a New Testament perspective, um, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, is that praise is meant to have a horizontal dimension as well as a vertical. So, yes, our praise is directed towards God. But actually, Paul, in both of those letters, encourages us to sing to one another. And I think that's something that we don't actually take seriously enough. So when I joined together in congregational praise so easily my focus is just on am I enjoying it do I feel engaged with God instead of thinking how can my praise encourage you if you're feeling a little bit beaten up at the end of your week well how can we be together in this praise of God or if I'm feeling beaten up how can I see in in your uh, engagement with God uh, an example a model a living faith that will inspire me to renew my praise again. So those three things, the many reasons, the many voices and the communal nature of praise are things that can help us along the way. That's really helpful. Thank you. Today we've come to the last part of Habakkuk's prophecy. Um, he's learned to trust God. The Christian faith is based on evidence, isn't it? And people say, you know, I would like to trust him. I, I know I should, but, and there's always this hesitation. What advice can you give us about that? And what reasons can you point? I, I, I mean, this is a huge subject, but can you just point to reasons that we have that we can go along and learn and become able to trust him more than perhaps we do or think we do? Thank you. Thank you, Archie. As you say, that, that could be a whole sermon series um, in and of itself, so I can only sketch a few things. Um, one of the mistakes that I am often tempted to make um, is to draw my evidence as to whether I can trust God by whether or not I'm enjoying his ways in my life right now. <laughs> um, and the reality is we can very rarely second guess the providence of God. We we don't know what he's doing uh, in our lives. Occasionally, we do have insight and he gives us particular wisdom for a particular situation. But very often, there's much mystery around God's ways in our lives. And if we make that the basis for our, our evaluation of his, uh, his stance towards us, um, we can easily go wrong. We need, we need something, something better. Um, I tend to look in, in two directions, one a little bit negative, one in a sense more positive but one thing that I think is really important for us to do is to look atheism secularism squarely in the eye and see where it takes us and ask if we actually want to go there because the secularists are very good at kind of marketing their worldview very attractively no restraints lots of freedom all this kind of thing but actually when we poke it, when we push through it and really understand it, what we're looking at is a universe that I think most of us don't want to inhabit. A universe with no meaning beyond the meaning that we create for ourselves, no basis for morality beyond the shifting sands of 
of human opinion, no basis for hope other than just mere optimism, no comfort in sorrow other than a bit of therapy, no ultimate accountability for human evil, and no ultimate restraint on human power. Um, no basis even for being confident that the way that we perceive reality bears any correspondence to reality itself. It's, a, it's an empty nihilistic universe if the universe really is without God. And I think sometimes, you see this so often in the Old Testament, the way that the, the, the writers kind of mock paganism. It's very subtle, but so often they're, they're helping us see um, the, the, the pretensions of, of paganism and secularism. And I think we need to be able to do that ourselves. So that's the negative. On the more positive front, we need to recognize, of course, doing that work about secularism, it doesn't itself prove anything. It just might set us asking some questions about whether there is a better way. But there is then lots of positive evidence for the better way. And, and especially our evidence focused on the person of Jesus himself, because as you said, Christianity is not a philosophy of life or even an abstract system of doctrine. It's a response to God's acts in history. And that sets it apart from really every other worldview. So the way I tend to argue that is I begin with, okay, the fact of Jesus' existence in history. We, we know that to be the case. Evidence, of course, by multiple witnesses in the New Testament, um, but also supported by uh, the Romans, Tacitus and Pliny, Jewish, uh, Josephus, Greek, Phallus. Uh, it's, it's supported. There's not lots of evidence outside the scripture, but there's a remarkable amount for the penniless preacher of Nazareth, as I think it was Malcolm Muggeridge called him. So he existed. The evidence also supports the fact that he claimed to be the son of God and was crucified for that claim because it was regarded to be blasphemous. Well, we have to then deal with the fact that this man existed and he made that claim. And what will we make of the claim? Um, and as I see it, the suggestion that this was a claim that was a deliberate falsehood or a delusion simply don't stack up with the reality of who Jesus was. Added to that, the evidence for the empty tomb, there is, there is no better explanation for the empty tomb of Jesus than that he rose and uh, continues to, to live to this day. You put all this together and actually there's, there's a great deal of evidence. And then of course, there's a continuing evidence in the life of the church by the power of the spirit as lives are transformed by the good news of the gospel. So looking at the circumstances of life will tend to discourage us all too often. Um, but when we look at the evidence for the existence and the claims and the resurrection of Jesus, we can find a robust foundation for living as people of faith and hope. Thank you, John. And you're going to speak to us now about the last part of Habakkuk's prophecy, where he comes to this point of faith. Um, Esther McCree is going to read that for us. But before she does, Bill Harvey will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for John as he brings your word today. Give him your strength to feed us from your word. Open our hearts to the word John brings and give us open hearts to hear and challenge us afresh. In these turbulent times, remind us the law, sovereign Lord is my strength. Enable us to have that encouragement knowing that in all things you walk before us and surround us with your never-failing love and that great peace that passeth all understanding. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make it known. In wrath remember mercy. Lord, let us hear and echo Habakkuk's prayer today. Lord, we pray for revival which must start with us. Guide us, 
what to do in our various situations as we revive your work. Guide and teach us what to pray for. Guide us who to share the four addresses we have heard, starting inside our fellowships and looking out to others who may be seeking. Help us to keep our eyes on our Lord and Saviour Jesus and encourage us each day from your Holy Word. Lord, in these turbulent times, enable us to look out as our Lord did on the crowds and weep, and be alongside them. Help us to make the Lord's work known to others. Lord, be with us today and encourage us in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This reading is from Habakkuk chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigionoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of thee, and thy work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years renew it, in the midst of the years make it known. In wrath remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Selah. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from the, his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed close behind. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low, his ways were as of old. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was thy wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was thy anger against the rivers, or thy indignation against the sea? When thou didst ride upon thy horses, upon thy chariot of victory, Thou didst strip the sheath from thy bow and put the arrows to the string, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows, as they sped at the flash of thy glittering spear. Thou didst bestride the earth in fury, thou didst trample the nations in anger, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, for the salvation of thy anointed, thou didst crush the head of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah. Thou didst pierce with thy shafts the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. Thou didst trample the sea with thy horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones. My steps totter beneath me. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree do not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like hinds feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, hello again. Uh, great to be sharing with you in this final session on the book of Habakkuk. Uh, I've never been uh, to Orban, but uh, I've been looking online and uh, find myself rather hoping that one day I will. It looks uh, very beautiful and, uh, and very interesting. But in any case, it has been a real joy just to dig back into this great book of Habakkuk in order to share it with you. Looking back on the last uh, year or so, I suppose I would say that my experience of the, uh, the COVID pandemic has been rather mixed, as perhaps yours has too. I look back to the early days when, for all the anxieties, there was, to be honest, something rather exhilarating going on. We had to, we had to learn quickly about how to move church online, and we had to, uh, to think creatively and, and do things differently because it was obvious that the old patterns were not going to work in this uh, this new situation. And uh, and then we, we quickly had to learn the crucial importance of, of small groups in, in keeping a bit of a sense of fellowship alive. And, and then we had to learn about Zoom and uh, discovering that you can pray with other people on a video call. We didn't know that before, strangely enough. And, and then in our context uh, here in Southampton, we also had rather extraordinary opportunities to serve our city, to serve our community, as we uh, worked with other churches to feed large numbers of homeless and hungry people and, and then to connect with people in various shelter, sheltered housing projects who were otherwise very isolated and and really to do these things on a sufficient scale that the local council has noticed and for now at least has come to a rather more positive assessment about the contribution that churches can make to society than was perhaps the case before. And all that was very energising and, and really rather exciting. But I suppose as time has gone on, the, the cost has grown relationships deprived of the kind of face-to-face -face interactions that can smooth over tensions and and just keep uh, relational capital strong those those have suffered then there was the the deep worry for our young people for their education for their health for their spiritual well-being their personal isolation and added to that the concern about the mental health and well-being of of our students and young adults, many of whom were really struggling. And yes, some of the older folk who had been self-isolating and were very alone. And of course, then those, those long months with, with no singing and, and such limited fellowship and, and just very little weariness with feeling rather isolated while constantly having to adjust to new rules and guidance. It's been, it's been difficult, hasn't it? Now, I've no doubt that there are many good lessons for us to have learned that we will want to carry forward into the future beyond the pandemic. But to be honest, like many pastors, I also sometimes find myself wondering what will actually be left of the church that was there before the pandemic struck. Difficult times. But what is certain is that this season has given us all a chance to reflect on what it means to trust God in turbulent times, as our title for these talks has implied, to, to trust a God whom we really don't understand and whose ways are often beyond our ability and capacity to trace out. And perhaps in the rather privileged Western world in which many of us uh, who are engaged with this convention find ourselves, these are questions that we have been rather sheltered from where brothers and sisters across the world have lived with them all the time. But this has been a season where those questions and challenges have come home to us as well. Well, in this final chapter, Habakkuk explores the challenge of living as people of faith in a turbulent world, no longer through the, the kind of dialogue, the, the Q&A of chapters one and two, but now much more personally, as we find ourselves listening in on Habakkuk's prayer 
and we learn about his faith not so much in in dispute and dialogue but on his knees in the place of prayer and we see first of all that this is a faith that responds a faith that responds verses one and two i wonder if like me you've ever had the experience of being really steamed up about something and then gone to kind of have it out with somebody only to realise that you jumped in far too quickly and jumped to the wrong conclusion and ended up sounding off about something that you really didn't understand at all. It's a, a painful and a rather humbling experience, but I'm sure if one that we're humble enough, we can learn from. It can be a life-changing experience sometimes. And it seems to me that's rather what's happened to Habakkuk here, as we've seen. He, he began by asking God this this honest question, God, why don't you do something about the mess your people Judah are in? And then God responded with this troubling revelation that he intended to use Babylon to discipline his people. And, and Habakkuk responds with howls of protest. How can you do that, God? The Babylonians are far worse than us. They can't surely be your instrument of judgment against your people. But God responds again and says, actually, I will. But then afterwards, I will also judge Babylon for its arrogance and brutality, while those who keep trusting in the word that I have spoken will live. That's been the dialogue. Brutal, difficult. And we get to the end of chapter two and the questions have been asked and the answers have been given, whether palatable or not. And Habakkuk has reached the place where the time to protest has come to an end. He's reached the end of the rose. And he concludes chapter two, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Silent before Yahweh, enthroned, glorious and sovereign. It's a little bit like Job at the end of his painful dialogue with God, isn't it? As, as Habakkuk realises that he may not understand God's ways, but he is called to trust him. And so he falls silent, moving from protest now to prayer, from fear now to faith. Now, I wonder if that's a journey that God has ever called you to make. It happened to me a few years ago. I I was on a bit of a wave, really, a, 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 the crest of a wave, and, and things, as far as I could tell, were going really well. But then there were a series of setbacks that I couldn't handle. There were a litany of broken relationships that I couldn't fix. And that combined experience, frankly, left me in pieces. There was a period of, of deep depression that followed as I tried to reflect and, and make sense of what had happened and, and where God was in it all. I had to have some help from a, a wonderful Christian counsellor and, and help from my GP with some medication. But I really couldn't make sense of it all. And, and many tears were shed and, and many protests to God were made. But then a, uh, a key turning point came for me. And actually it was when I was reading this book of Habakkuk's prophecy. And I reached this moment where, where all the earth fell silent before Yahweh in his holy temple. And I realised that for me too, it was time to move from protest, how can God do this to me, to prayer, how does God want to change me? And so begin the journey from fear to faith and transformation, a journey which I very much still remain on and in which I feel very much a learner, but an important journey nonetheless. In the same way, Habakkuk here begins his prayer by, by humbling himself before the God whose ways he cannot comprehend. Verse 2, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. It's as if he's saying, Lord, I've always been told how great you were and how far beyond us you are. But, but now I'm beginning to see it for myself. Who am I, after all, to tell you what you may or may not do? Who am I to think that you should only do those things that fit with my preferences, with my ideas, with my comfort, my convenience? No! Rather humble and uncertain, 
but at last stunned by your holiness and silenced by your majesty. I stand in awe of you and the things that you are doing. And then he responds to what he has learned with these three requests at the end of verse two, where it's as if he's saying, OK, Lord, go ahead. Do what your holy wisdom says must be done. And let's go forward in this together. Middle of verse two. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. You could summarise his three requests here as for revival, revelation and rescue. Revival, revelation and and rescue. Revival, first of all, he says, I am in awe of what you do. Now do it again in our day. Literally do it in the middle of the years or in the middle of history. In other words, this isn't just a kind of vague prayer for things to work out okay in the ends, at the end of time. No, it's a prayer for God to act in the middle of time in a way that gives us a taste now of what he will do in the fullness of time. And of course, that's really what revival is. It's an intensified taste of heaven now as the Holy Spirit, who is given as a foretaste of the age to come, is poured out on us with unusual intensity. And it's as if heaven touches earth with renewed power. Revival. Revival. God had promised in chapter one, verse five, that he would do something in Habakkuk's day that he would not believe even if he were told. And of course, as we've seen, Habakkuk didn't believe it when he was told. But now he does. And whatever his remaining fears, he says, yes, Lord, execute your awesome deeds now. At this moment in history, in our time. And he isn't just praying here for some kind of heavenly firework show, a kind of shock and awe. Now, along with the prayer for revival comes a prayer for revelation so that God's ways are not only seen, but also understood. He says, in our time, make them known. Yes, step in and act. But please, Lord, step in and speak too, so that it may be clear that what happens is not just geopolitics. It's you who've come in power. Let it be seen recognised, understood, let it be revealed, made known. And then the third request, a request for rescue at the end of verse two. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, you are allowing your people to pass through this time of immense pain, of deep difficulty, of painful discipline. But let this not be the last word. In your wrath, deserved as it is, remember your mercy too. Rescue us, O oh Lord. Revival, revelation, rescue. Seems to me we need exactly the same responsive faith in our turbulent time. We don't know all that God is doing in this pandemic or in all the other changes going on in our world. And to be honest, we're probably best not to pretend that we do know. But it is beyond doubt that the foundations of our civilization have been shaken. And we've seen so clearly in the, in the pandemic that the limits, we've seen the limits of our ability to control the events that, that unfold with, with rapid U-turns in government policy as, as events, events move beyond what was anticipated. We've also seen that things that we long relied on to give us security and prosperity and peace, now look very fragile. We don't really know what's going to be the economic hit at the end of all this. Yes, in this context, Christians have been called to, to step up and, and show God's love by, by serving our communities. There's much we don't know, but there are these things that we, that we do know and that God is not surprised or on the back foot. He is working out his plans. And so in our confusion, we say, yes, Lord, act in our time. Revive your deeds now in the middle of history and show to everyone it is you who acts. And in your undoubted wrath of the sins of your people and of our nations, still remember the mercy of the cross and sweep in a great harvest of people. 
through faith in your son Jesus and what he did on the cross. Revival, revelation, rescue. You might even want to write those three down and and make a commitment for the coming week just to pray them yourself each day. Revive your work in the midst of the years. Reveal your purposes for all to see. Rescue many through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Faith that responds. But then Habakkuk takes a look back in history because his faith is also a faith that remembers. This is verses 3 to 15, a a long kind of poetic uh, section. Begins verse 3, God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. God came. What majestic words and what words to inspire faith as Habakkuk calls for him to come again and to renew his deeds. Taman and uh, Mount Param here are in ancient Edom near Mount Sinai. And and that was a region which was in many ways the cradle of the Israelite religion, where God had revealed himself to Israel in, in earthquake and thunder and fire and given them the word of his law. And through his words and through his deeds, he had made himself known. He had revealed himself, as Habakkuk has just asked that he should do again. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. Yahweh showed himself. He came. And then what follows in the verses ahead is is not so much a a kind of neat chronological history of of everything that happened after the Exodus. Rather, it's a, a poetic stream of consciousness peppered with allusions to God's acts of revelation and rescue through Israel's history. Verse five, plague and pestilence remind us of the plagues on Egypt prior to the Exodus and of times of God's discipline in the ongoing story of his people. And then in verse six, the idea of God pausing to see the state of the earth. He he stood, verse six, and then coming in earth shattering power to reveal and to rescue. Well, that had happened time and again, but the focus here seems to be on the defeat of the Midianites in the book of the Judges with the story of Gideon. And then verses 8 to 10 seem to echo those those times when when land bridges were opened through the Red Sea and through the River Jordan. And and verse 11 recalls the moment in Joshua 10 where the sun and moon stood still in the sky. And then Habakkuk says, why? Why did all these things happen? Was God having a go at the creation? Verse 8, were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? Was God angry with creation? No, it was to judge the nations and to rescue his people. Verse 12, in your wrath, you strode through the earth. In anger, you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, just as God has told Habakkuk that he is about to do again. And ultimately, of course, God's acts are about the assertion of his kingdom rule, destroying the leaders of wickedness, end of verse 13 and 14, and installing his anointed king, middle of verse 13. As Habakkuk prays, Habakkuk remembers, remembers the God who has revived and revealed and rescued throughout history. And he prays for him then to do the same again in the middle of time, in his time, just as we might pray that in our time. But of course, as we do the same, we have far more fuel to our memories than Habakkuk had. For if Habakkuk remembered the God who had come from the land of Sinai into the story of Israel, we remember the God who came from heaven itself in his son Jesus and stepped into the global story of his people to revive and reveal and rescue. And in the cross and in the empty tomb, we know that God has judged sin and defeated evil and declared Jesus to be son of God in power, the rightful king of the nations. We can look back and remember all that, 
We know him to be the God who has come in history and therefore who still comes in the middle of history and who will come again at the climax of history when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom finally and forever. And forever. In turbulent times, we need faith that remembers, faith that is not just stuck in the moment, but remembers all God has done in Jesus Christ as we ask him to come again in our time to reveal, to revive, and to rescue. Faith that responds and prays. Faith that remembers all God has done. And then thirdly, faith that rejoices. This is verses 16 to 19. And of course, these are famous and moving words. They're also very honest and grounded words as well. Habakkuk has accepted what God is going to do. But he still fears what's going to happen. Verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. He's fearful of what God is going to do. He knows his people are about to face most exceedingly difficult times at the hands of the Babylonians. And he will be with his people. He will face them too. It's no wonder that he's afraid. But his mind is settled. He has heard the voice of the Lord. And so middle of verse 16, he's resolved, I will wait patiently for what he has promised, for the day of calamity to come on the nation that is invading us. He's going to wait because he has learned to trust. Now, there is no easy triumphalism here. It's totally grounded. It's completely realistic. Verse 17, he says, though the fig tree does not bud, Though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls. He's very realistic about what's going to happen, but he doesn't stop there. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Why? Why on earth will he rejoice when all that's going to happen? Well, he explains, I will be joyful in God my Saviour, the God who promised life to those who trust the word of his promise and keep faithfully trusting it. God is saviour. The God who is there is Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant God of his people who will finally come through as their saviour. And in that assurance, Habakkuk's heart rejoices and the joy of the Lord is his strength. Verse 18, I will be joyful in God my saviour. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand, uh, to tread on the heights. Honest fear, resolute patience, grounded realism, joy in God, strength to leap through the mountains of trouble and stand on the heights. It's magnificent, isn't it? What a, a wonderful response of trust in the sovereign Lord, the Lord whom he still doesn't understand, but is nonetheless his joy, his hope and his refuge. A wonderful example for us. But I believe this example is also an invitation to us, an invitation to us to live in this prayer ourselves as we face turbulent times, and to make that prayer our own. Yes, of course, we should in these times be working to rebuild our church communities. After all the setbacks and the restrictions and the struggles, enjoy our singing, enjoy our gathering, enjoy being together again to the extent that we're able. Wonderful, do it, yes. And yes, we should still keep serving our communities and not disappear the moment that things start to get a little bit easier, perhaps, but rather use to the maximum the opportunities that God has given to serve and reach our communities for Jesus, joining together words of words of, of gospel truth and, and deeds of, of compassionate service. Serve and reach for Jesus. Yes, let's do it. But action alone is not enough. This is a season also where God calls his people to prayer. A season 
for drawing in prayer on all he has done in the past with the faith that remembers. And for rejoicing in all he is to us now with the faith that rejoices. And then petitioning God to work powerfully in this time of struggle and crisis to revive his church and reveal his glory and rescue his uh, rescue people in our society. May God make us faithful as we reflect on these wonderful lessons from the book of Habakkuk. Faithful in action to rebuild and to serve and reach. Faithful in prayer for the glory of the name of the Lord, that he would once again revive, reveal and rescue. Let's pray together, shall we? And maybe in our prayers, we will take a moment just to be quiet, to bring to God our own struggles and fears, the things in our lives that we don't understand and that frankly don't seem to make sense. Let's be honest with God. Lord, we have heard of your fame and we stand in awe of your deeds. There is so much that we don't understand, but we ask for grace to fall silent before heaven and to begin to move from protest to prayer, from doubt to devotion, from terror to trust. And we cry to you, Lord, as Habakkuk did, that you would revive your work in the middle of the years. As you have moved in the past, Lord, in our nation, so move again, we pray, in mighty reviving power. Give us a fresh taste of heaven on earth as the Holy Spirit is poured out liberally on your people. And thousands, millions are swept into the kingdom through faith in Christ. Revive your work and reveal yourself, we pray. Make your actions known. May it be apparent to everybody as we seek to, to serve and reach our communities that, that this is not just a bit of, of kind of social work and do-gooding, but this is the people of God living out the heart of God for the glory of God, that his ways may be, may be revealed in our time. Speak, Lord that people may see the glory of Christ and be drawn to him. And Lord, rescue many, many people. Rescue us, Lord, where we are troubled and don't know the way forward. But rescue many who don't know Jesus for his kingdom and his glory in our time. And rescue, Lord, our broken society. Renew and restore and help us to be good news as we seek to work with others to rebuild it. Revive, reveal and rescue, we pray. Lord, how we praise you for all that you have done in the past, supremely in Jesus, but reflected so many times in your faithfulness displayed in our own lives. Give us the faith that remembers. Give us also the faith that rejoices. And may that joy sustain and strengthen us so that we can leap on the mountains of trouble and stand on the heights of faith with ready obedience and courageous mission that seeks your glory above all things in the communities where you have placed us. We ask it all, the glory of Jesus.